Thank you, Steve. Good afternoon, everybody. This morning, two very violent, serious attacks occurred in our city, resulting in the death of one innocent person and significant life-altering injuries to another. This marks our city's ninth homicide of 2024. Attacks like these shake our collective sense of comfort and safety, and I am grateful that a suspect was quickly taken into custody by our VPD officers. Although it will take time before we have all the answers, I can tell you that it does not appear that either victim knew the suspect, and we believe these attacks were completely random stranger attacks. These investigations are in the earliest stages, and there are still many details we either don't know or I am unable to share with you at this time. However, I am here today, joined by Mayor Ken Sim, to share what we can and to answer questions about these tragic crimes. I'm also joined by Deputy Chief Howard Chow, who commands our, investiga our operations division, and Deputy Chief Fiona Wilson, who commands our investigation division. I want to recognize Councillors Peter Meisner and Mike Lawson, who are also here with us today. VPD officers responded at 7.38 a.m. to reports of a man who had been attacked near Cathedral Square, which is at Richard Street and Dunsmuir. Officers found a 56-year-old man who had been attacked with a knife. He was bleeding from the head and had suffered a, severe, a completely severed hand. The man was taken to hospital for emergency treatment and is expected to survive. Approximately eight minutes later at 7.46 a.m., VPD officers were called to West Georgia and Hamilton Street, which is a couple of blocks away from the first call, after a second man was attacked. Despite efforts to save his life, the man died at the scene. The victim's identity and age have not been confirmed, but he appears to be approximately 70 years old. Investigators and members of the VPD Victim Services Unit are currently in the process of confirming this man's identity and informing family members next of kin of his passing. I want to offer my heartfelt condolences to the victim to, who survived and the families and loved ones of both of these victims of these serious crimes that occurred today here in Vancouver. While investigators from VPD's Major Crime, Homicide Unit and Forensic Identification Unit begin collecting evidence from the two crime scenes, VPD patrol officers obtained images of the suspect, confirmed that the two incidents were linked and began searching for the suspect. Shortly after 9 a.m., officers located the suspect on Habitat Island near the Olympic Village. That's that small island at the north foot of Columbia Street adjacent to Hinge Park. They responded to reports of a man behaving erratically who had approached a stranger who was our reportee and began yelling at him. The suspect, who we subsequently arrested, is a 34-year-old White Rock resident. He was taken into custody by members of our emergency response team and patrol officers with assistance from a VPD drone pilot. The suspect is currently at the Vancouver Police Jail. I applaud the witnesses who called police immediately and provided timely information to us. I am extremely proud of the brave VPD officers who responded very fast to tend to the victims, to gather evidence, to search for and ultimately arrest the suspect and stop this imminent public safety threat. More than 90 officers were involved in this investigation so far today and dozens of police officers and civilian professionals will continue in this investigation in the coming days and weeks. Officers from our patrol, community safety officers, emergency response team, K-9, multiple drones from VPD, our operational command center, our duty officer, homicide detectives, robbery assault detectives, forensic specialists, victim services unit, and other specialized VPD units all pulled together and are currently working on this case. Homicide investigators from our major crime section will be preparing a report to Crown Council and are recommending serious criminal charges against the suspect. Because he has not been charged yet, I'm unable to tell you his name at this point in time. What I can tell you is that this appears to be a very troubled man who has a lengthy history of mental health related incidents which have resulted in more than 60 documented contacts with police throughout Metro Vancouver. He has a prior conviction for assault, prior conviction for assault causing bodily harm, and at the time of his arrest, he was on probation out of White Rock for an assault that occurred in 2023. 
We have not yet confirmed whether there is a motive for today's attacks or what that motive is, and we are investigating the possibility that mental health was a contributing factor. I know that many people in our city and beyond are troubled by what has happened today. Crimes like these, seemingly random and unprovoked, cause everyone to fear for their safety and the safety of their loved ones, and rightfully so. Let me assure you that incidents like these, while high profile, are deeply disturbing. They are rare. We have seen other cases, though, in Vancouver, where people have come into Vancouver from the suburbs, from other cities in the surrounding area, and committed acts of extreme violence in our city. We do live in a safe city, and I just want to mention that the great support we have had from Mayor Ken Sim and his city council, we have taken significant steps to make it safer. And I just want to give some context on that, because I'm sure this will come up in the Q&A, but I just want to give some context on it preemptively. We've hired more than 175 new police officers since October of 2022, allowing us to increase visible police presence in problem neighborhoods and bolster our investigative capabilities. We've instituted metro teams, which are rapid response teams able to respond anywhere in the city between districts much more quickly. We've put targeted resources on high-risk offenders, repeat violent offenders, chronic offenders, using resources from patrol, major crime, our chronic offender unit, and other specialized units, and have had some very significant success with that through projects such as Agility and Reclaim, and also engaging the BIAs and different community policing initiatives, as well as our significant mental health partnerships that we have with Vancouver Coastal Health which have all been bolstered over the past year and a half. Total crime in Vancouver is down 7.4%. Violent crime in Vancouver is down 7%. Property crime in Vancouver is down 10.3%. Unprovoked stranger assaults are almost half what they used to be. Serious assaults, being assaults causing bodily harm, assaults with a weapon, aggravated assaults, are down 17.8%. So just to give you some context on where we stand with uh, the most recent crime numbers. I'm now going to turn the, uh, the podium over to Mayor Ken Sim, who will provide some comments, and then we'll be happy to take some questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you uh, for being here today on short notice. Um, Today, a tragic and deeply unsettling uh, incident occurred, a random stranger attack. The attack, as uh, the chief mentioned, claimed the life of one uh, innocent uh, individual um, and uh, you know, life-altering uh, injuries to another individual. And so to the loved ones, uh, the families, the friends of uh, the victims, uh, on behalf of you know, um, City Council, the City of Vancouver, Vancouverites, two of our councillors that are here, Mike Klassen and uh, Councillor Peter Meisner, we want to send um, our thoughts and our condolences to all of you during this incredibly difficult time. And as uh, you know, the Chief uh, alluded to, we have a lot of resources, so if you feel um, that uh, you need any assistance from VPD or uh, the Mayor's Office of the City of Vancouver, please reach out. Now, to the people of Vancouver, uh, I understand that this uh, incident is causing a great deal of anxiety and concern. These feelings are normal. It's deeply disturbing to think that something like this can happen in our community. And every single person who lives, visits, or simply just wants to enjoy the beauty of Vancouver does, uh, deserves to feel safe and reassured that the city is working hard to protect them. And I do want to acknowledge and thank um, the, you know, the VPD and the medical first responders for their incredibly swift response. I also want to um, commend the VPD uh, for uh, apprehending uh, the perpetrator as quickly as they did. Their swift actions, make no mistake about it, prevented further harm from happening. And our administration views public safety as a major priority, and that's why we've committed to fully funding uh, the VPD, and that's why we will back our emergency services to make sure that they have the tools they need to keep our community safe. But I, I, I want to get raw and real here for a sec. Because personally, I'm sick. 
and I'm tired of hopping up here and having these conversations. It's not the first time. And I know Vancouverites are sick and tired of hearing us uh, talk about this as well. And don't take this the wrong way because the, our first responders were absolutely amazing in what they did. And I'm sure Vancouverites are sick of hearing how quickly that we reacted to a violent crime and how additional harm was prevented because of the quick actions of our amazing people. We're thankful for that, but you know what? I think we would rather have a situation where, not, where we're not put in the situation in the first place, where these violent acts don't happen because we're treating, you know, we're pivoting, and we're actually solving the root causes of these problems. And so I can tell you, every time we come, we're on the stage and, you know, we talk about how we react. It's, uh, it's of zero comfort to the victims and their families and their friends. Um, anyways, it's, it's, it's incredibly troubling. And I, I don't just say that as a mayor of Vancouver. I say that as a resident of Vancouver and just a person in the community. We're all in this together. And so I want to be very clear here. Vancouver is, you know, and for that matter, every single other municipality and city in this country, be it Toronto or Montreal, Kamloops, Nanaimo, White Rock, we can't solve these issues alone. First of all, we do not have the jurisdiction to address the root causes of these issues. And we face gaps in our public safety approach that require action and funding beyond the municipal level. And so we need the province and the federal government to address these gaps, especially when it comes to mental health, um, especially when it comes to the mental health crisis that basically every single town and city in this country is facing. Now we do appreciate the province has already demonstrated their willingness to adjust policy that isn't working. And we've seen the changes in how they work uh, firsthand, uh, you know, as it related to uh, their pivot on decriminalization. We want to thank them for that. However, more work needs to be done, especially by the federal government when it comes to tackling violence and the mental health crisis. So I, I just want to be really clear here. We have a choice. If we don't pivot, expect to see more press conferences like this. Period, full stop. We're pretty much doing everything we can do as a municipality and so are all the other municipalities out there. It's not in our wheelhouse to deal with most of the root causes that, you know, have us stand up here today. And so let's just call it what it is. And that's not coming from a politician, that's coming from a concerned resident, that's coming from a person in this community. I'm like every single other person in this country that feels this way. And so let's not make this political, let's pivot, forget about what's happened in the past, it doesn't matter. Let's look to meaningful solutions, let's get to the root cause of these challenges and let's you know, pave a path forward, one that actually works. And so again, our condolences go out to the, the, the victims, the families, the friends, everyone that's been affected, all the people that have been jarred um, by this incredibly disturbing event and uh, I know this isn't any consolation very far from it but at the city of Vancouver we will continue to make the investments and work towards making this place a way safer place and having the difficult conversations that need to be had um, so we can make this place a better place thank you Okay, I will moderate a Q&A here. Um, Daryl? Uh, this one is for uh, Chief Palmer. Uh, you were talking about trying to identify the victim. Uh, there is a particular gentleman who sleeps at the Queenie Plaza uh, because he is houseless. Um, do you know any of the circumstances that put him in that place that early in the morning by any chance? You, when you're referring to put him, are you talking about the suspect that we arrested? No, I'm talking about the victim because he was killed at a, at a spot where I, I, I'm, I'm just speculating here, but there is a particular houseless gentleman who sleeps there quite frequently. I walk by him every day. 
I'm not going to deal in speculation. I'm just going to deal in facts. And we don't know the identity of the victim yet in the homicide. We believe he's about 70 years old. We're trying to determine his identity and we will be notifying his next of kin. I don't know who this person is yet at this time. None of his circumstances, I know. No, I don't even know his name. Um, with the first incident, did the attack actually happen at the steps of the church, do you know? And because there's blood around there, and was this victim either leading church or, or heading to the church, do you know? I don't have that level of detail. I know that it was at Cathedral Park, which is basically right across the street from the, the church you're talking about. So I don't know if it was dynamic and moving in that direction, but what I know is that our call was to Cathedral Park, and that's where we found the first uh, victim. Okay, and I'm just going to ask, was his hand recovered? Do you know if there was any? Yes. Was there an attempt made to try and reattach it, do you know? Uh, well, that will be the hospital that would do that, but this gentleman was taken to hospital with his hand, and as far as how that's playing out, I don't know what the, um, the doctors have been able to do with that. Uh, yeah, Chief Palmer, so you're saying there's nothing to indicate that either of these two victims were or are unhoused? I have no information on that whatsoever. Okay, and just quickly, did uh, police ever locate a weapon? Um, I can't discuss that at this point in time. Charges haven't been laid. That's obviously going to be an important part of the investigation, and that will come out at a later time. Um, I assume, obviously, the thief, the man that's, that has... Uh passed away, was attacked with a knife. What can you, it, it isn't exactly clear in the press release. Can you confirm that? And also what were his fatal injuries? Um, the person that passed away, I can't confirm. I cannot confirm that it was a knife and I can't confirm what his fatal injuries were. That's part of the investigation. And uh, our homicide detectives are still working on that. Okay, and can you describe what the scenes were like to turn up to this morning? Um, I can't from firsthand knowledge because I wasn't there, but my understanding is that they were horrific. Um, especially when you're going to a scene, like I've been a police officer a long time, as have uh, other people in the room, and I've seen lots of things that, you know, people shot, stabbed, murdered, and, and things like that over the years. But, you know, having a severed piece of your body is, is a very significant injury and would be uh, terrible to see, horrifying. Alana, then, like... Do you have any details about what happened before any of this? Was there talking, any interaction, or can you share anything about that? This is still a really fresh incident. It happened early this morning. We're still just hours away from it even just occurring. So that will all be part of the investigation. We're pulling CCTV video. We're speaking with witnesses, talking with 911 callers, people that may have cell phone cameras or dash cameras. So that will take a while to compile all of that. So we will obviously during the investigation develop a timeline and get witness statements and, and you know paint a picture of what happened. But I don't have enough detail to provide you that right now. Suspect was on probation. He, he lived in White Rock. Was he violating any of those orders being in Vancouver? <clears throat> Uh, my under that's a good question. So yeah, he lives on White Rock, probation on White Rock. My understanding is that he was not breaching his conditions by being in Vancouver and that the conditions on the probation order were quite, uh, quite light. Okay, and you have said that Vancouver, after all these stats, including stranger attack data, yeah. is safe. Yes. And the mayor said doesn't want to get political. Obviously, this is immediately being politicized. Yeah. So what do you say to, to candidates of all stripes at all levels that are using the public safety in Vancouver? You hear that the city is dying, that it is very unsafe. What do you say to politicians who are making hay out of attacks like these and saying that it is very unsafe on the streets? Sure, I'm happy to answer that. <clears throat> I'm not going to address politicians specifically. My answer is going to be to the people of Vancouver and the uh, you know, surrounding area. So I'm not talking to politicians, but I get your point. And let me just say that there have been a lot of things that we have done. We've had really good success. Vancouver is not dying. Vancouver is not dead. Vancouver is not unsafe. That's all hyperbole and it's not actually factual. There will be in any big city in Canada or North America, there will be shootings and stabbings and acts of violence, and this will not be the last one. And no city in North America could ever purport to not have any more crime. So there will be more violent crime that happens in a city the size of Vancouver. What I will say is that our crime numbers are way down, and I gave you the numbers. We will still have um, crimes like this that will disturb the public and are disturbing to me and I'm sure to you on a personal level, um, you know, as, as members of the media. But on the bigger issue there, let me just say that there are certain people, uh, most people suffering from mental health issues in our community will never have any contact with the police. 
Um, there are many people that we have compassion for that have mental health issues that we want to see get help and get on a better path. But there are also people with mental health issues who are extremely dangerous that we need to be afraid of and we need to have institutionalized. And this person, uh, in my estimation, is going to fall into that category. And as far as things that can be done, there's many things, and I talked about a lot of them that we've done with, uh, from a police perspective. But, you know, this is, this is another person, as I mentioned, coming into the city, perpetrating extreme acts of violence in our city. And we deal with the front end of it very well, arresting the person, protecting people from any future harm. And, um, but I think that we have to realize that there's too many unwell people walking around in our streets. And there's a lot of people suffering from mental health, addiction issues, uh, people that have severe uh, criminal backgrounds or a combination of two or all three of those and people that are a danger to society. And what we need is number one, we got to stop the revolving door of justice, catch and release, whatever you want to call it. You hear all the catchphrases. We need more people to be held in custody for serious crimes. We need uh, charges not to be stayed. What I mean is when we present, you know, multiple charges to Crown Council, and we see in many cases, a lot of charges are stayed. And I'll be quite frank, I know that that's happened in the history of this individual with some serious charges that were stayed that um, I do have some concerns about and charges were not pursued. He has a history also of assaulting police and healthcare workers. Um, we also need more mental health supports in community. We need more addiction supports in community. And we need more help dealing with the upstream drivers so that these folks are not coming into contact with police at the tail end of the equation. And it would be great to see troubled individuals, whatever their situation is in life, get those proper supports from other levels of government and other government and non-government agencies that are not the police that can help them get on a good path in life so somebody does not decompensate to the point where they're running around downtown Vancouver attacking people um, and assaulting people and murdering people. Um, I know you've got a follow-up. We're going to go first with Ben and then Susan Lazarick uh, before we go around the room a second time. Back Chief away. Palmer, uh, you did rattle off quite a few statistics about crime being down, but yeah. I don't know if I missed it. Was there a baseline? That, those, those numbers indicate crime is down since when? Yeah, those are, those are 2024 numbers here today. Those are in 2024 compared to last year. I just wanted to confirm again about the location of the attack where the man had his hands severed. Yes. If you go square, is that the patch of like a little park that's north of the church? Because there's no tape around yes, that. Yes, that's exactly where it is. Yeah, but there was no tape around that, and the police were never there. They were only on the steps of the church. So what we were just trying to determine was, did the attack happen on the church steps or the landing in front of the front doors? So... The only clarification I can give you on that is that our call was specifically to Cathedral Square. It's quite possible in a dynamic incident that this person moved around both the suspect and the victim of the crime. They may have ended up at the church and if we have crime tape up there, it's probably related. I just haven't been to the crime scene myself, but good chance because they're literally right across a one-way street. And if there were blood on Cathedral Square, there would have been tape around there, probably. Yeah, I'm not at the scene. Yeah, I'm just, just telling you, like, we're, we're right. talking literally one side of the street to the other. So when calls come into police, we respond to that location. If it's, it's literally from me to that back window, that's the distance we're talking, like between Cathedral Square and the front of that church. It's, it's just so a, it's 20 it's an feet. important detail for us to get right. on the church steps or in a park. Right. So that's what we're trying to do. I know what you're saying. So our call was to Cathedral Park. When we got there, it may have been at the church, but I'm just giving you the best of my knowledge what I know at this time. Uh, you've um, talked about mental health. What sort of state was he in when he was taken into custody? Um, I don't have those details. I know that when officers from our emergency response, so what happened was the citizen called in and I do, I also just want to take a, a sec to really thank members of the community when they see violence or suspicious circumstances because this person at Habitat Island had no idea what had transpired previously. So he, this person saw a suspicious activity, a suspicious person they were concerned about. They called 911 and it turned out to be the person. We had a drone in close proximity. We had our drone hover over that area and actually picked up the suspect right away. They helped guide in members of our emergency response team, followed by patrol officers who took the person into custody. Um, there, it was not a violent arrest. It was a fairly straightforward arrest. Uh, and that's all I can tell you. And 
charges? I don't know anything about their state of mind or what they said or anything like that. And how soon are charges expected? Um, I'm hoping soon. Um, as you can imagine, this is, a, this is a large file to put together with multiple victims, many people to interview, um, multiple scenes because we had the two scenes where the incident happened and then of course the scene where the person was arrested. So there's a lot of things to process here. We have a large number of officers and specialists working on the file. Um, I can't give you an exact timeline, but we're going to work um, day and night to get charges to Crown Council. And then they're the ones with the authority to lay criminal charges. So maybe not today? I doubt if it would be today, um, but we're going to try and get it done as soon as possible. Just the injury to the head, can you explain anything else about that? I know there's... No, I can't. I'm not going to get into any more detail on specifics like that at this time. You, you do have a lot of background about the suspect. I know you can't name him. Yeah. Did you just put his name into Prime and CPIC and all this stuff came up? Can you tell us anything more about the background that came up when you were able to uh, you know, look into him a little bit? Yeah, I mean, there's various databases we used. You mentioned a couple of them. Of course, yeah, we would look use those databases to determine a profile on this fall. Uh, is there anything that came up that you perhaps didn't mention already? There's all kinds of stuff that's come up about them that I haven't mentioned. So well, I'm just giving you sort of a synopsis. Please enlighten us as, as much as you can. I, I can't at this point because I'm going to give you the general sense of what happened, who this person is. More details will come out. And I know as investigative journalists, once he is named, when charges are laid, you will do your own research. But I'm not going to give you, you know, this date, this time, this location for every 60 files that he was involved in. Can, can you reveal what kind of charges were stayed against him perhaps, just to, just in general? There were crimes of violence. Was his 2023 assault in White Rock or Surrey or Vancouver? White Rock. White Rock. And was he um, a member of the repeat offender program, the new one that's been stood up? Um, I'm not aware that he is. I'm not 100% positive on that, but I don't believe he's at least part of the VPD one, but um, I'm not 100% positive. We'd, we'd, have to, we'd have to fact check that, but I don't believe he's part of ours because he's not a Vancouver resident. How many are in the Vancouver division of that program? And how's that going? Um, I don't know. Uh, Deputy Wilson, do you happen to know how many in the Rewide program we have in Vancouver? Just I think there's about 80. 80? Is that, uh, does that, like, is that the tally that you can staff, or is that just fluid depending on the, the supply of folks who need that oversight? Those are, those are the highest risk ones that we do an assessment. Um, we work with our detectives, um, and then we have other resources, obviously, that we tap into through mental health histories and things like that, but people that are the, the highest risk for the, uh, for the REWI program. CCTV, was there any um, um, footage being collected from church steps? Uh, there's CCTV footage being collected from all over. I, I can't speak to the church specifically, probably, because it was right, it was right there, but um, I don't want to speculate on exact locations, but there'll be lots of, that area of the city and the downtown core, there'll be lots of CCTV. Would that ever be released? Um, we would not normally release that as part of our investigation. We, we do in cases, as you know, where the suspect is unidentified and we're trying to identify the person. But in this case, the person has been arrested. So we wouldn't because it will form part of the evidence that will go to Crown. Michael, hold. Uh, then we'll go around the room one more time. Chief Palmer, this happened at a, in a very busy place at a very busy time. Yes. I'm just trying to wonder, like, how did the suspect get out of the area and get so far and then was arrested over an hour, well over an hour later. Just like, I imagine there's a lot of witnesses and just trying to piece all that together, like how he got out of the, the downtown core basically. Right, so we're trying to piece that together as well. We did have lots of officers responding, but between the first crime scene and the second crime scene, it's about two blocks away roughly. So you would have officers going to the first scene, you would have officers going to the second scene, they would be you know, tending to the victims. Initially, is going to be their first priority. Other officers would be getting suspect descriptions, putting it out, calling in resources from other parts of the city. So it's very dynamic. But an individual on foot you know, can cover a lot of ground um, you know, if they're moving fast. So this person obviously did cover quite a bit of ground. because It's probably you know, two kilometers where he was arrested from when the, the incidents happened. And sorry, just quickly, were there a lot of witnesses? Were there a lot of people that watched these? We had a lot of witnesses yeah. were interviewing. Yep, I don't know the number, but yeah, there's yeah. a lot of witnesses. Okay. Yeah. 
Uh, we've seen some pictures from the crime scene of a man wearing a blue-green windbreak jeans and some joggers and missing a hand covered in blood. Is that, does that match the description of the man who had his hand severed? I don't know because I haven't seen those same pictures you have. Our detectives would obviously and our investigators would be dealing with, with the individual, but I can't speak to that. The guy who reported the suspect acting erratically at your hour, was yeah. he walking his dog? What was he doing? Yeah. Dog, yeah. On the island? Um, right in that vicinity. I don't know if he was on the island or just on the path right there, but uh, he was in that vicinity. But uh, can you confirm there's a video on Twitter of the arrest down at Habitat Island? It could be. I have no idea. It's possible. I just have no idea. You haven't seen anything? No. People just, uh, I haven't. And just to follow up on that, are you aware of any other significant arrests involving ERT at Habitat Island this morning? No. no. Um, can you tell us uh, more about the role of a drone pilot in locating the suspect? Sure. So Vancouver, Vancouver Police, we call it our um, RPAS, Remotely Piloted Aerial System. We have a very uh, sophisticated RPAS or drone program here in Vancouver. In this incident, we had multiple drones up looking for the suspect. So when we have in-progress calls or we have calls where we're looking for a missing person, a suspect, could be a bank robbery, whatever it is, uh, we will put a drone or multiple drones up uh, into the airspace to help uh, locate suspects or missing people, depending on the circumstances. And they were utilized in this case. So like, they f was, it, was it aerial footage that found the suspect or was it the call that brought you to AKA Beer Island? It, it was the caller that called 911 and then we had a drone respond there that was actually close by right away and picked up the suspect immediately. Is that drone program out of the regular VPD budget or is it funded, or funded by the foundation? You know what, it's out of the VPD regular budget, but like probably five, six years ago when we started it, I think our very first drone was founded by the foundation, but that was a long time ago. Since then, it's all been part of our budget. Any other follow-up questions? Not follow up, but we learned about the suspect being in custody from a tweet from uh, Public Safety Minister Mike Farnworth. I wonder if you could reveal the nature of the conversation you could have with Mike Farnworth this morning. We've had no conversation with Mike Farnworth. How did he find out about the suspect being in custody? You'd probably have to ask him. Looks like it's all. Okay. Thanks, Thank everybody. Thank you, everyone.